Mr. It Adam helped. Rudolph, thank you so much for joining this. It's a big honor to have you here. Oh man, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so again, thank you so much for participating in this talk. Uh, we are live on Instagram, and uh, I I wish um, I I know that you are a great composer, a, a, a person who had you know worked extensively through your life and uh, about with conducted improvisation also. And I know you have your, your very own specific thing. And I would love to hear from you. Uh, what do you have to say about how, how did you start it? Uh, how did it start it? And you know, what you developed during the, those years? Right, okay, well, uh, so uh, that's a good question, a good place to start. So Go Organic Orchestra, I started it in uh, the late 1990s in Los Angeles when I was living in Venice, California. And um, the uh, idea of it was uh, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of great mentors in uh, this oral tradition, um, uh, to name a few of them, Charles Moore, Malawi Nerudin, Don Cherry, Yusuf Latif, um, and others. So it felt like it was time for me to be uh, sharing, and there was a lot of musicians around interested in what I was doing. And um, at the same time, I was trying to think about a format uh, to channel those ideas and express some things I was hearing. I've always been interested in the idea of how can you have as much freedom as possible with a larger ensemble, of course, with a duo or a trio, it's it's um, fairly straight ahead. Um, that's how it started. When I moved back here to the New York area in 2000, I started coming back here more in 2005. Uh, I started an orchestra here, and most of the musicians in my orchestra here are still with me now. We're 15 years later. Wow. Uh, it's and same in Los Angeles. There's a, a um, the people who are attracted to it. I don't it really. The instrumentation was open, so I don't really look to find. It's more about the people who where we have a mutual feeling of interest mm. and so on. And I just want to add a little bit, just right off the bat, before I forget. I don't really use the word uh, improvisation anymore hmm. into my music. If you uh, look up the word improvisation, what it means is to do something without any previous, without any preparation. So I prefer the word spontaneous composition because we do prepare and we prepare as individuals uh, in terms of um, just like we, you, this, our conversation is spontaneous, mm -hmm. but I'm getting you prepared. You know a little bit about what I do, you have your own background in this, and so on. And so the preparation of the individuals and the ensemble is, is very extensive. So that allows us to be spontaneous. Um, and uh, also the idea of composition brings a certain kind of care and thoughtfulness to what we do. So when I work with my musicians and we talk about spontaneous composition, when you think about composition, you think about a certain kind of care of how you you cultivate interval materials and rhythms and phrasing and form. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want to add to the answer to your question is um, uh, I want to say Go Organic Orchestra is both a group and it's also a process. It's a way of doing things, a way that I've developed and I, is, is still an ongoing process. Uh, so I've gone around the world uh, many, many places and taught, I don't know, hundreds, I don't know how many musicians uh, from any kind of background, any um, uh, age group. I've had 14-year-olds and great senior masters like Yusuf Lefouf and Benny Maupin and Ralph Jones involved, uh, J.D. Perrin, great elders, and then kids also, people from backgrounds in what we call classical music, jazz, so-called, all these electronics. It's open world, what people call world music, I don't, but 
all these backgrounds, everybody is welcome if they have a mind and an inclination to want to um, learn about the process of how it works. It's both organic work, it's both a process and it's an ensemble. Wow, that's, that's incredible. And uh, I would love to hear a bit more about this process you mentioned. Um, okay, well, the process, so there's sort of um, two big arenas that we could speak about the process. One, and they're certainly related. Okay. But one is more specific musical material, and one has to do more with the humanistic philosophy that informs it. So um, I don't know if your listeners are interested in very particulars about the uh, more musically technical parts or want to just know more about how we approach it. Well, I think, I think you could share uh, both things uh, because this talks is about technical and spiritual aspects. So we can, we can go with both things. It would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe I can contextualize it um, this way. Uh, in, as I think of it, Go Organic Orchestra is really about um, relationships and what we call integrity of relationships. So in other words, here's the, uh, the score materials that I develop that I can talk about more. There's myself as a conductor, and when I think about conducting, I think about it more in the idea of being an electrical conductor, something for some energy, spontaneous ideas. There are musicians who are participating, and the idea of listening to and cultivating, uh, having their voices be heard and shine. And then there's the uh, audience, what we call audience, the other people who are maybe not uh, actually generating sound, but are part of the experience. So the organic orchestra, in a way, is about the relationship of all these things mm -hmm. that happen in a spontaneous way. And because it happens in the moment, every concert is different. Um, there's an there's a integrity between the materials of the continuity of materials and what I call novelty, mm -hmm. which is the spontaneous, the surprise element that we always love in what we call improvisation, something that surprises you, right? Wow. And uh, where you don't know what's going to happen next, right, that mm -hmm. idea. And so we're trying to create, the goal is to try and create a environment in which everybody's voice can really shine, their inner spirit can be expressed, but we can avoid, at the same time, we can go deep into a commonality of an aesthetic feeling, which is what in Indian music they call rasa, mm -hmm. rasa, that which colors the mind, the feeling, okay? And which is, uh, and then um, I would say, uh, uh, um, that spontaneity, the voices, then there's the idea of the collective voice of how we sound together at that moment. And so it is a celebration in a way, philosophically, it's an applied philosophy, it's not an abstract philosophy, it's actually an expression of a philosophy of acknowledging the moment and the spontaneous moment, the, uh, what Don Cherry used to call the, the eternal now. And so for the audience, of course, people experiencing it for everybody there, the beauty of it is when you get on board, you're moving towards something, but you don't know what you're moving towards. It's unfolding. Now, what might seem like a something contrary is really a polarity because I do use a score, mm -hmm. even though I'm trying to have the least amount of written music as possible. The score materials are what I call the DNA, which allow us to focus on, let's say, the topic. The topic can be the intellectual topic, the spiritual topic, the feeling topic. For example, you and I, we're not talking about everything. We have a starting place where we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 
So this works. This is how I uh, have constructed the score. It's very simple. It, the basic parts of the, the score that everybody has the same three pages usually on their music stand. We've gotten to the point now, though, where a lot of my musicians in the New York Orchestra understand, excuse me, the conceptual framework that informs the score materials. And the score is, so that, that's, yeah, let me just, before I go off into that, that's, that's the basic parameter of uh, how we're thinking about things. Three things I always talk to everybody about when I teach the Ugo Organic Orchestra. Because mm-hmm. I teach some people who are very experienced in um, what we call improvisation, spontaneous composition. And then sometimes I teach people who, like I was in uh, Palermo Conservatory not long ago, and the violin instructors were in the orchestra. So these guys, they're in their 70s, these absolute amazing virtuoso violinists, you know, Paganini, all this, you know. Never had improvised, never had played without paper before. Um, I was I was able to through using the materials of the score to get them to be able to play their ideas in a very short period of time, and this idea of of bringing everybody in to create something that's prototypical at that moment is very important. So the score is 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 designed with the idea of, uh, it's like what I call the DNA of the music. Because if you give, if you give, if you just say to somebody like that, oh, just, just improvise, Mm -hmm. you know, just play. Well, they, they, you know, you've had this, right? If they don't have a, if they don't come in an oral tradition, then they look at you like, what, what, you know? So this gives them a focus. So a classical player like that and say, uh, if we're playing, uh, if I ask them to work in like what's the symmetric hexatonic uh, scale, which is a, a matrix, the hexatonic matrix, that's a topic. So a rock pe- person with a rock and roll guitar background, a classical uh, background player, a jazz player, they can all be playing inside of this topic of hexatonic using the matrix. I'll show you. I have some samples here I can show you on the screen. Awesome. And they they can all bring their voice and what they have to say. They don't have to go outside of the naturalness of what they do to be able to talk to each other about this. But we're trying to avoid cliches, hmm. right? This is what we all, all of us who do spontaneous composition, we all have our favorite things that we fall back on that are not, don't have to do necessarily with the naturalness of what's happening at the moment, right? We're all trying to move outside of that. And, and uh, of course, this is what the great masters, Miles Davis, Thelonious Monk, they were able, Yusuf Latif, to set up the parameters for the ensemble to guide to, uh, what was it? I think, was it Coltrane once said, he, uh, or somebody that when they were playing with Thelonious Monk, it was like stepping into an elevator shaft. You know, you just like, it's open. You have to find a way, you have to find your way. You can't rely on the old tried and true. So um, so the score is a way to guide us in a non-linear way. So we know in of course the so-called jazz tradition people use tunes and they use a harmonic form. Uh-huh. In music they might use a raga or tala as the form. So I'm like, okay, what is, how can we, what could my, my idea back in the 90s when I first started thinking about this, how do I create the parameters for everybody that can help us come to something that is the now, that's us today, that sounds totally prototypical and in the moment. And that led me into an investigation, uh, which I'd already done, into concepts of understanding how Intervals work, how rhythm works, how color in music works, and starting to design, and then the relationship of mathematics and language in music. Hmm. That's that's super interesting. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. And I've read some. Uh, I read that article you sent me once. I think it, it is published on Arcana Five book. And uh, yeah. it, it is called about uh, music and mysticism, rhythm and form. Correct me if I'm wrong. And there were 
great concepts there that you are mentioning uh, quickly here. And I, I can remember some of them that were, were related to rhythm and you were talking about verticality and circularity. And, uh, and, and you know, um, I, I love the way you put these philosophies and the mathematical aspects together with spiritual aspects. So you join, you know, the science and spirituality. And well, uh, uh, having that said, I wonder how do you see the role of the conductor? You know, how, how do you see, is, is it a spiritual uh, uh, form or is it, you know, mathematical form uh, as a composer or how, how is your creative process as a composer? Well, well, that, actually, those are two, those are two really good questions. Okay. You know, my <laughs> and the, and what it means to be conducting, and they're related but different. Or, as you probably know, I'm a hand drummer and percussionist myself, right? Mm -hmm. So, of course, when I play my hand drums, when I conduct, when I compose a string quartet, which is through composed, all of these things are different, but they're related, of course. And you mentioned the word spiritual. Uh, it's almost like another word, like we were saying about improvisation, that deserves a little bit of commentary by itself, right? Because what does that mean? It means many things to many different people. Mm -hmm. I like to, I, I have this, there's a beautiful quote by a great uh, scholar of, of Congo, you know, Congo with a K, which is, of course, is so important in, in Brazilian culture. Uh, the Congo uh, culture, they, uh, uh, his name is uh, B Professor Bunseki Fukiao. He was from the Lemba uh, uh, um, uh, um, el uh, um, esoteric group. Anyway, he said something I love. He says, we are born spiritual, we learn religion. Okay, so spiritual to me, and I'm actually talking about it in abstraction, but it certainly relates to this idea of how we approach music. It's about being in a state of naturalness and understanding, uh, and this is a process, I'm not saying I'm there, this is what we're the process of living, right? Of being in tune with nature, understanding what nature is, understanding that, that we are nature and the fundamental dynamic of what nature is is change. For example, if we're talking about rhythm and we talk about time in music, right? So time, I lived in Africa for a year in 1977. And one of the things that was so interesting, many, many things, it was very transformative on many levels. But I began to understand that this idea of time, okay, I'll tell you this, uh, just a, a, a story about it. So the, I got very involved in the Brekete, which is a, a religious, a, um, like in Brazil, it's, it's called candomblé, but it's different. But the same idea of rhythms and songs are used to bring down spirits for healing and people become possessed. So it was so interesting. The first time I went mm -hmm. and I started going a couple of times a week very regularly. So many things I learned about from that. But... One thing was so interesting, the, it, the, when it began, it wasn't like, okay, they said, okay, five o'clock, time to start. Uh -huh. it, when it started, told you what the, that the, now is the time it is starting. In other words, the event generated the time. Uh -huh. it, was, it was this linear time that the event was placed in. What that means is... If you understand in music, we understand time is only a phenomenon of what we are hearing and experiencing. And it's always, it doesn't exist as a separate entity. This is part of the illusion of written music that we need to kind of really move away from uh -huh. and not, we use it, it's a tool, uh -huh. but we don't become uh, 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 enslaved to it. Here, like, for example, when I say about being natural and understanding the nature of time, if you see a tree, 
you're and let's say you, you look at a, a tree, you're seeing actually you're seeing the uh, the seed that made the tree. You're also seeing the tree as it has died and fallen and and mushrooms fungus is growing out of it. Mm -hmm. When you see the tree, you're seeing all of these things. You see what you're seeing is a manifestation of the time of it at that moment. And one of the things this relates to what we do in what we call improvisation or spontaneous composition mm -hmm. it the moment that you're experiencing is something that's in relation to everything that came before it and came after it mm -hmm. but it's something that's manifesting at that moment um so that that's kind of i went off on a i don't know if that's makes sense but um uh so the neck i was oh yeah so i was saying about the naturalness right of of that and the spiritual we were talking about the spiritual part so being spiritual to me means being music. Do you know what I mean? What does it mean? Being spiritual means being in tune, right? Yeah. Being in tune with, with nature. It means being in harmony, being in harmony with our fellow human beings, right? It means being in rhythm, in rhythm with yourself. And when you're in rhythm, you're in good health, right? Being in tune, being in, in harmony, being in rhythm. So... All of these things we do, in, is it, it's an idea of even becoming music. And then we project these things out in the moment in a dialogue with everybody else. So again, back to the organic orchestra, I was always interested and I'm still interested in solving this challenge of how do we do that in a large ensemble? You know, mm -hmm. a duet, trio, you know, I just have a new recording coming with uh, my Hamid Drake and Ralph Jones. We've been playing together, Hamid and I, since we were 14 years old. We have a, we, for us to dialogue together, we don't need any, or the 25 years I worked with Yusuf Latif, we didn't need to talk about what we did anymore. We just start. But when you're with a larger ensemble, how do you design the parameters that are actually liberating rather than constraining? Hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's super interesting. Thanks a lot for sharing. And uh, since you mentioned that, I, I, I want to ask you something very specific. It's not related to music, but it is. So you mentioned uh, f uh, freedom and restraint. And uh, I, I want to make a parallel with this, what is happening right now with coronavirus and stuff. And uh, uh, let, let me see if I can be understandable. <laughs> but um, what I mean is, I always think about, you know, conducted improvisation or spent spontaneous composition as, uh, as, a, as a social practice, as something that, you know, uh, can, can add to people common lives, you know, to, to their lives and, uh, you know, to being the moment, this philosophy. And also because you have to deal with freedom, but also with some restraints, you know, the, the, the directives, the conductor and everything else. I wonder if you have any thoughts about the relation of uh, your, your practice in, you know, to be at home restrained, but also to keep positive, to, you know, to have your creativity and, you know, deal with the restraint with creativity. Well, I can certainly speak about what it is for me. I think one of the things that's been sort of fascinating about, I mean, you know, first, of course, you know, there's compassion and grief for the suffering. Uh, there's hope that there'll be some transformation in a positive way in the long term, you know. Um, but in another way, it's so interesting because everybody, how everybody's grappling with this is so individual and yet we're all grappling with it too, you know, it's shared. So for myself, it's been very interesting because of course, like a lot of people, tours have been canceled, concerts, you know, this is, we're not happy about that. But in terms of my home life, things are, when I'm not on tour and performing, it's very similar. I'm always, always working on music and always, um, but what that means is has to do with process mm -hmm. and I don't want by the way one thing is process but also doing you know I mean every day 
Tom Cherry used to say to me, uh, and there are many people, I'm sure, he said, you should touch your instrument every day. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and when I go into my studio, the energy of coming into the room, right? There's an energy when you go into a room. And then if you sit down, then there's, and then if you get up and you, so my first energy is my, when I go in my studio is I go directly to my drums and I touch them. And they, 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 and, and uh, I might be there for one minute or 10 minutes or an hour or it depends. And I, we, we, we I, and so that for me, they, I play hand drums and there's, there's some really incredible uh, striking the drum and playing with your hands, manipulating the overtones. This is very powerful, you know. I, you know, am at the piano. I mean, whatever. I'm mixing, editing, recording. I'm whatever the process right now. I'm, you know, I'm doing all kinds of things. So process, there's two things. There's process and there's hard work, you know. And... We should never, uh, and the work, you know, there's inspiration, there's intuition, and there's work, you know. Uh, I don't even think about everything I do as composition, because again, you know, this is like kind of limiting. When you think about composition, first thing people think, okay, I'm sitting there writing notes on a paper, it looks, and I do that, you know, like here, here's a, this is like a piece I use in the organic orchestra sometimes, right? Nice. So you can... It's traditional Western notation, and I write string quartets and blah, blah, blah. But I think of myself more as an inventor mm -hmm. than a composer. You asked before about the, you know, and because by striking the drum, my putting my pen to paper, um, my conducting, these are all aspects of creative activity. And I, by the way, I said earlier, I, f I forgot to follow through with this. When I speak to people about what, and this answers your question, I think, in an indirect way, about what we're doing with the organic orchestra, I think about there's three things. There's listening, mm -hmm. there's imagination, and there's sharing, right? Listening, imagination, sharing. This, these are all, and they're not, again, not separate entities. It's about the relationship of these things, right? And they're moving all the time, right, like that. So um, uh, 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 when people, when we can listen to each other and hear, the great improvisers are the great, great listeners, right? Of course, that's the first thing. But this is something, of course, in some musical training, these are the things, by the way, that are the hard that you can't really teach in the way, right? Like I can teach somebody if I say, okay, here's here's a one of the here's part of the score. I can explain this, and I will explain it if you're interested. Yeah, sure. Technically, <laughs> I'm saying I can explain that. Mm -hmm. But how do you explain to somebody how to listen? And this relates to what you're saying about the the world we're living in now. This is a everybody has their own uh, body, mind spirit experience of this mm -hmm. and how they're processing it and if they're being awakened and this uh, and the idea what i said earlier that the fundamental aspect of what we experience is change well if anybody thought that there wasn't true before they certainly will accept it now right this is this is change happening in a in a uh in the most fundamental way right then we don't and this idea of certainty and knowing that's the thing. So it's so interesting in Western music, right? What, there's a way to listen to music and a very satisfying thing. I say, okay, I'm going to go hear, uh, you know, uh, Beethoven's, right? or I'm going to put on a record of, uh, uh, of uh, Miles Davis. There's something so satisfying about hearing something that's an old friend, but it's a different experience to understand, to relate to music in terms of what it is as an expression of spontaneous composition and acknowledging that it is about change and the moment now. And that's a whole different kind of experience. And um, I think people who um, can learn how to listen to music like that and, um, and, and also play music like that, it's an incredible, it is a beautiful uh, 
we can say spiritual or has to do with the mysticism of our own evolution, the relationship of creativity and of, in our personal life. Wow. Outstanding insights. You, you have great ideas. Thank you so much for saying and sharing all this, all this. Yeah. Thank you a lot. <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, since you, you offered, I would love to, to hear a bit about, you know, the charts you do. And I would love to geek about uh, your te uh, technicality of uh, conducting as well, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, so it's interesting because you, so I started, like you were asking about the history, which I didn't tell the whole story about it, but I had to... Uh, so I had the idea of doing this Go Organic Orchestra, but didn't really know how to proceed. And I started developing the score materials and the hand signals completely from my own mind. You know, I didn't know about anybody else doing it. Later on, of course, I've learned about this great tradition going back to people like Muhal, Richard Abrams, and Dizzy Gillespie, Lucas Foss, Butch Morris, you know, I found out. But at the time... I had to, you know, think about it, and I did it. It was intuition, you know. And listen, we can talk about intuition a lot. Intuition is something so important. So I these signals, I was like, okay, well, this will be louder, this will be softer, this is higher, higher, this is lower, you know, these kinds of things, starting with very spontaneous ideas. And then when I developed the score, I've always been interested in the idea of, language and syntax mm -hmm. and I wanted so this idea again this linear idea of you know when you play uh, uh, in form how do you work with form so the score I started developing this uh, using this idea maybe you're familiar with it uh, you know about Arnold Schoenberg and his I think they're called magic squares right okay so so here's the thing but of course, you can. You don't have so they use twelve tones, and you have to use all twelve tones, and then they do the inverted is backwards, and then the uh, I'm sorry retrograde. The, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I do that in a very creative way. Sometimes I do it that way, and other times I don't. So, for example, this is page one of it's one of the score. This is page one of the score, kind of from far away. So if you look, see which one has a number, right? Okay. Okay, and each one is a different set of intervals constructed in different ways. So when I say number three, everybody's eyes goes to number three here. Okay. Which is hexatonic. Okay. Now, this hexatonic, this is like a DNA. This is like the topic we're going to talk about. This is a certain kind of combinations of intervals. Starting in the late 50s, early 60s, we know that great artists, uh, Ornette Coleman, Yusuf Latif, Eric Dolphy, John Coltrane, Cecil Taylor, many, many others, uh, too many to name here, started moving away from harmonic forms to construct their music and became more and more interested in constructing things from systems of intervals. Mm -hmm. I personally learned about this hexatonic it's called the symmetric hexatonic scale. Probably some people know it already. I learned it from Yusuf Latif, and then I also learned it from a book by Oliver Messian called the, uh, uh, it's called the language of my musical, what is, it, uh, what is the name of the book? Anyway, he calls it, it's one of his modes of limited transposition mm -hmm. because the symmetric hexatonic scale is what's called a half step and a minor third alternating, right? See? Okay. Okay, so why is that so beautiful and why is that useful for an improviser? The same way like what's called an octatonic or double diminished scale that Miles Davis and many were using, it had multiple tonics, so you're not stuck in one time, right? The hexatonic, symmetric hexatonic scale is six tones. There's four of them, and then when you come back, uh, so the one that starts on C and the one that starts on E, is the same scale, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Okay. So now, so this is, so once everybody understands this, how it works, and of course moving down, I don't know if I can, can I, 
Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to finger. Okay. And of course, I'm moving down in fifths. And because even though, but there's four, one, two, three, four hexatonic scales. Mm-hmm. And these are the first again. So it allows, it's, it's a, it's like raga. You know, I, I, I studied North Indian classical tabla for 20 years and I more, and I also been very interested in raga. So a raga is more than just a scale. Uh, it's like blues, you know, but it has certain kinds of um, characteristics and every raga has a rasa, a, like I said before, a sort of feeling about it. So this hexatonic has a different feeling and sound completely than this one, which is what I call the clustonic, okay. or, or this one is pentatonic, right? I think I'm showing you the right one. And this one here is based upon a raga called Sri Rag, Sri Raga, right? Okay. So, a literal rock. So all of these things are, so when I use, a, a, you know, I shoot people to that, and they can either, I can conduct different gestures with it, mm-hmm. uh, and have everybody, I can orchestrate, I can say to somebody, okay, you improvise, you're playing what you want, maybe a trio or one person, but it can also be if somebody is playing a more aleatory open thing, I can know that I can conduct, if I give my finger across, I can conduct them this way, oh. I can in parallel, I, I can have one, you know, oboe can be going here, bassoon here, uh, clarinet here, violins here. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And or anybody in parallel, or when I want to get really, or what about if I'm conducting part of the orchestra here and somebody else in the orchestra here? Mm-hmm. You see, so these are like DNA because they have the most potency of, of what they can become. And I can combine these things in every kind of way. But of course, I don't predetermine that. I'm listening to, uh, I don't like the word soloist, but I'm, it's a call and response between somebody who is maybe moving through that. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I might cue somebody, I write these pieces, like, because as you know, some musicians like to read and some musicians don't, right? So but to read, like this is a piece I think for, well, it's for any treble clef instrument, I maybe, I think violin, flute originally, right? So this is based upon this, these same materials. So I can work, that can become an orchestration with somebody playing open with my conducting and I'm conducting totally based upon what I'm hearing at the moment. Just like, so I'm improvising, I'm doing spontaneous composition. We're creating the form, we're creating it at that moment. The orchestration is spontaneous. So it's never the same, it's never the same thing. That's kind of how that part of it works. Page two of the orchestra is um, usually one is, is so those are called matrices, mm-hmm. all right? And I just want to say something about it, that language-wise, it's very, these are really, ultimately, everybody, the reason I like this more than graphic notation is because everybody can bring their own phraseology, their own musical language. Like I said before, if you're like a, a classical guitarist or you're um, a, 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 a so-called jazz tenor player, you know, or you're, uh, uh, you know, whatever your language you can, or you, and also just you as a human being, you can bring your language to understanding this. And of course, the better you know this, the freer you can be. Mm-hmm. So musicians, my New York musicians, and actually once you understand, like for example, this, am I showing the hexatonic? Yeah. There, I can't see, yeah. Yeah. So once you understand the concept of it, half step and minor third, you understand you don't even need to look at the paper. You understand what hexatonia is all about. And of course, language, unlike spoken language, I can't speak to you backwards, but I can certainly play backwards. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Here, this can go forwards. I can go backwards. I can go down. I can go up. But there's a particular linguistic quality to it right and and each one of these combinations of intervals has its own feeling and sound to it so it gives us a topic of conversation it gives us an aesthetic focus 
and it allows us to really everybody's to express their own language and you know sometimes i've had this experience with some so-called free improvisers who, who felt constrained by that without understanding that within parameters you know that there's ultimate freedom also you know freedom i mean you know it's it's freedom for the thing to become what it is you know free of cliches you know i mean so that's sort of that part of it oh and then i was going to say so those are the matrices and then there's also what i call cosmograms so usually there's uh, what what i call the triple diminished cosmogram and i don't know if we want to get into explaining what is triple diminished but it might sometimes it looks like this i've made many of them uh, this here's another one so this is a beautiful thing you know if you know something about candomblé for example mm -hmm. and the, and the uh cosmo the cosmogram drawings that are sometimes on the ground you know they're portals what a cosmogram means is it's symbols which are an opening into a universe a creative universe and a spiritual universe so here right I mean, if I cue somebody to, to do their spontaneous composition in here, they can move this way, this way, here, right? So you might be over here, somebody else might be over here, but you're playing your language, your feeling, your energy with it. But we're all dealing with this triple diminished, which is a way of organizing 12 tones. Um, it could also look like, um, here's another triple diminished cosmogram, right? It's a different one, all right? So uh, it allows for people to bring their own voice uh, to it. And of course I compose using triple diminished also. Um, triple diminished is also something I learned from Yusuf Latif, who was my great mentor. And he said he learned it from Don Bias which I think is really interesting. And I haven't found a lot of other uh, references to it, even in the Western European uh, references. So, but it does go back to Dom Bias, which I think is so interesting. So this idea of a cosmogram being like a portal into something that opens you up into a creative universe. Now I can also conduct the triple diminished. You see, I don't know if you see the, the arrows there. Mm -hmm. So this one is number this is number 10. So if I cue number 10 to the orchestra and I go this way, then the music, if I cue to the right, then the musicians, as I conduct them, or whatever, loud, soft, high, low, or maybe high and low or whatever, mm -hmm. they can have orchestration moving through that. And each one of these are very, very different combinations of intervals. Very, very different. So that's uh page two and page three stop me if this gets too technical for people no, no maybe, keep going this is awesome for you maybe i don't know anyway in page three here's a page three one of the page threes this is called the ostinatos of circularity mm -hmm. this i very reluctantly put into western notation but it's to help people quickly learn and that is the bridge to the rhythm concept and the rhythm concept we can talk about uh, quite a bit also. But before I do, I should just, yeah, yeah, so I should contextualize. Anyway, that's that so far, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Adam, I, I can't thank you enough. This is a, a high-level class. Thank you so much. This is outstanding. Yeah, very, very nice. Uh, please, well, please keep 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 saying whatever you you want to say about rhythm I, i'm super interested mm -hmm. okay well before i before i talk about rhythm i want to just take a step back for a second and connect what i want to say about rhythm to um what you were asking me before before about spirit okay okay because and when we understand when we think about the nature of what is and of course, many musicians who have given it any thought, we understand, we know the fundamental nature of what is, is vibration, right? And we know that, right? Everybody talks about that. Our physical form, this, the, uh, 
the table that you're sitting at, everything is vibrating at different rates, right? We know that. And they're sort of grosser and finer. Music is so amazing, right? I mean, let's, let's, just, let's just say it again and again. How is it possible that vibrations, my intention, right, a person's intention can go through, can send an instant voice into, in, it cause these vibrations to go through the air, go into your ear and actually make you dance or cry or give you goosebumps. I mean, you know, I just want to acknowledge this phenomenon, right? It's so, and that the musicians for us to remember that we're doing, we're dealing with this kind of sacred alchemy, right? Mm -hmm. And to remember that. Vibration, so what is, what is the material we're working with It's vibration? Vibration is what is. And it manifests, however, when we try and talk about it, we have to talk about it as duality, right? I can't tell you what is up if, I don't, if we don't talk about what is down. You can't know what is dark if you don't know what is light, okay? The first duality that comes from vibration in terms of how we experience it as human beings is what's called, um, I would call it uh, color and motion. So color in musical terms is timbre, right? It's uh, harmonics, harm harmonics, harmony, melody, all of those things. Motion, of course, is what we call in uh, the English language, we call it rhythm, right? Okay, so it's rhythm. These two things are manifestations of the same thing. And they are the same thing because in terms of mathematics, if you under the dimensionality of sound comes from something moving in three, which is odd, and two. All right. I don't know if I should go into this right now, but 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 the rhythm is the same thing. In other words, the harmonic series, when you understand the foundation of the harmonic series, the fifth mm -hmm. is the first, the, 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 the harmonic which gives you the dimensionality. Because prior to that, you only have the point, which is the sound, and then the octave, which is double, right? And that's it. It's linear. But when you add the fifth harmonic, then you have dimensionality, because now you have the fifth. You can take the fifth of the fifth and the fifth of the fifth, and you have the spiral of fifths that happens, right? This gives you so the uh, the three that becomes gives you all the dimensionality. The same in the rhythm. If I'm just having a pulse, it's only a pulse. But once you add three, something odd and something even, that gives you the dimensionality. Three against two in terms of mathematics is the fundamental dimensionality in rhythm, motion, and three against two in the harmonic series. The fifth is also gives you all the dimensionality. So if I padded three against two, mm -hmm. fast enough, you would hear the fifth, right? Okay, many people know that and understand that. So there's two things manifesting. Why is this important? Because there's a mathematical understanding that resolves itself ultimately into language, which is the deeper reality, and also dance. But three and two, uh, so as I said, in 1977, I went, I lived in Ghana, West Africa, and I went up into Mali into visit to stay with the Dogon people in the cliffs of Mali. And they have a very interesting proverb. They, they call the, they have the same idea that three and two odd, so a rhythm that is odd, we call three odd number, is a male energy, okay? They call it I, I talked about this in the article, too. I want to share it with the people listening. They call it nya. Okay, that's male energy. We can think of it as yang energy in the yin and yang system. We can think of it as shiva in terms of shiva shakti energy, right? Uh, many other ways. So nya, even two, is what is the female energy, what the dogon, they call it tolo. And we could call it yin right energy we can call it shakti energy 
And the, the proverb is, every rhythm is a marriage and an interplay between tolo and nya, male and female energy. So no matter how abstract a rhythm you're working with, it's a manifestation of this three, this odd and even. Mm -hmm. So I started constructing rhythms. I wanted to find a way to bring rhythm and what, what we, what in the vernacular, what we like to call groove, right? I mean, Brazil, you know, America, we live in a groove culture. We like, it's African diaspora. Africa gave us, you know, this, this incredibly sophisticated, diverse, deep idea about, I mean, there's many rhythm concepts, there's endless, but this idea is important to us. I wanted rhythm and that kind of feeling, the dance feeling, the body feeling in the music. So, but I was trying to not, again, not have cliches and not say, okay, now this is this rhythm, this is that rhythm. Looking at, so I started looking at this mathematical aspect of rhythm and making these constructs that of this three and two, that could then you could have any language you want with it. And I also wanted to create a rhythm concept where every time I had a new piece of music that people didn't have to learn a whole new rhythm over again. Right, like in Candomblé, right? Right, these different rhythms, they show up with a lot of different Orisha, right? But they're different rhythms, but the concept is the same. So, or in Indian music, we have Tala, what's called Tala, right? And there's there's some 1,008 or 108, there's many theoretical tabla, Talas, but in North Indian music, they use seven or 12 almost all the time. So once you know the Tala, you can fit one Tala together with a different Raga. So now we have all these matrices, right, elements, then we can have all these rhythms, they can all be plugged together, combined in endless ways. So, for example, I'll show you one rhythm. I had to move also to, to share my idea of rhythm. I also, Western notation was not working mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons that we can talk about or not. So, like, here, here's a page from my book. So, like, here's one rhythm that you hear in a lot of my music. I use it again and again in different ways. It's, so, you see there's seven triplets and then three groups of seven, mm -hmm. okay? That creates what I call a signal rhythm, right? So, and once everybody learns that rhythm, that rhythm is gonna show up in a lot of different pieces, or it can be combined, like here, it can show up, this is the way I've been notating rhythms, not, not for reading, but just to represent what's happening. This is a 63 beat cycle, oh, which wow. has, three of those 21s going around, because the rhythm is both, this is what I call an ostinato of circularity. So from the signal rhythms, I can create many ostinatos of circularity. So once, it's not so hard, once everybody learns these, maybe 12 signal rhythms that I use, and again, I design them like the intervals where they, not every rhythm qualifies to be a signal rhythm. It has to have, this male-female potentiality to have all kinds of linguistic applications to it. You know, fast, slow. Uh, uh, so, for example, this, this one here, this is a 54-beat cycle, which is actually 27 twice, okay? So this, I can use, I've used this in like a string quartet, through composed string quartet, but then my musicians have learned it. You can hear it like on this, uh, the recent release of the uh, Go Organic Orchestra, this Ragmala record with the Bukhtan Raga Massive, or my last record with my octet. Uh, there's a piece called Rotations, uh, Glare of the Tiger. It's there. I wrote a through composed percussion piece. I can use it because it has so much potentiality and integrity to it. And if somebody else learns it, you know, they can use it too, of course. It's not, it's something that we share. These things don't belong to anybody. It's just an idea, a way of thinking about it. And uh, it's how I think about it. So signal rhythms that become ostinatos of circularity that can have pitch materials in them like this, right? Okay. 
that can be cued by me um, that relate to the matrices and the cosmograms, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I was saying in the beginning. Everything is about integrity. And integrity means the relationship between the musicians and what they bring to it and trying to bring out and in inspire their voice to come out. The score materials, these three pages, which have, and, which, and, and then the rhythm concept, and then how I'm conducting, and again, I'm not conducting like, like the Western conductor of trying to bring forth something in mind. I have to be, like the musicians, completely ready to accept. And like I said, it's more like being an electrical conductor, electrical conductor that conducts the electricity. And I'm listening, I'm using my imagination, I'm trying to share and lift. What do we all do? We're trying together to lift the musical moment into some transcendence, something that touches, it exists for the body, for the mind, for the spirit. And that, that, so that's the integrity, the relationship of all these things are always moving. Everything's changing, everything's shifting. It's all spontaneous composition. And um, uh, that's what we, and it's intuition. You know, I can't say enough, you know, you're asking about relation to what this is in terms of life and where we are now or any time. For me, the cultivation of intuition is the most important part of it. Mm -hmm. And intuition means being open, right? So when we conduct and we, as you know, you do, you know, you conducted improvisation or the other people you're talking to, as you know, one of the amazing things about it is you can't do it again the same way, right? Right. That's in, that's because intuition is what's leading you. And intuition is an interesting phenomenon because intuition erases its tracks. Mm -hmm. When I explained to you here about uh, about like uh, uh, the triple diminished, right? I can explain to you intellectually what is triple diminished, mm -hmm. this combination of 12 tones and how I devise it. And then you can do it. But I can't explain to you, and I'm sure you can't explain to me, ultimately, when you conduct, and I'm telling you all these things I do, but ultimately, it's intuition. In intuition, we cannot, we, when intuition comes, you can't go back and say, oh, I did it exactly like this. No, intuition, when it comes to you, you can accept it and be ready for it and be open for it. All you can do, this is why I say about preparation, why I like spontaneous, the word. All you can do is prepare yourself to have the openness and resonance for when intuition, to receive intuition, like putting out your radar for it. And that's, of course, your personal cultivation. That's your creative life. That's how you breathe in and out every moment. And that's the idea of cultivation of intuition and being open to it and hearing it. And that's a way of living, too, right? Yeah. No. Adam, I'm I'm speechless. I I can't thank you enough for sharing all those great ideas, great thoughts. I I'm seeing that my life will uh, finish in ten seconds because the application will over. But I I would like to continue and ask one last question so I can record in my my Skype session here. And uh, because you talked about all those great great ideas. I thought, uh, I, I, I'm interested in how do you deal with the error? You know, how do you deal with uh, the wrong in all of, this, all of this? Because you are talking about a lot of technali technicality, but also you are talking about a lot of spirituality. And I, I wonder how do, you, how do you, uh, you create the parallel between those two? Well... <laughs> I, I have a fun feeling you sort of know the answer in a way that there is no wrong, right? Of course, you know, there's something, some things that, in, in other words, how can I say, uh, I mean, there's parameters. So uh, in, in, wrong, in, the, in the moment of... Uh, um, uh, there is no really right and wrong. There's something that works better than other things. And as you know, when we conduct 
the spontaneous composition or we conduct spontaneously. Sometimes everything is like super magic. And sometimes it didn't quite, or there's a moment where it didn't quite, you know, and uh, so it's better, we like it better, or it's, it's worse, you know, but it's not right and wrong, I don't think, that way. Um, of course, there's wrong when, so we have to learn how to make the mistakes work, too, you know, because it's happening right then. So one way is like, for example, the rhythm. So this rhythm, if you're playing in this, uh, uh, here's another, this uh, 60 beat cycle here, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're out, then you're out. So you have to know how to come back. Or if we're conducting, right, we have to know how to make what is, quote, the mistake sound good and make it make the mistake, not the mistake. You know, Thelonious Monk, of course, he said there are no mistakes, right? So this is back to the idea of preparation, mm -hmm. right? And the preparation is you want your musicians to be have command of their materials. You have to have command of the materials. It's like everything, like when I play my drums. Your ideas have to lead your technique. And your technique, virtuosity, is what gives you freedom. Mm -hmm. But virtuosity only exists relative to what you're trying to do, right? How can you say a drummer in a candomblé is this his virtuosity is the same as somebody playing uh, uh, Mozart on a violin? It's a different virtuosity. Right? But but your virtuosity is the the that's why the musicians in organic orchestra they come to me. I don't really go out and hire anybody. I find the musicians who have the attraction and this is again about relationship and the magnetism and we we orbit in together who are really interested and are going to devote themselves to to become really facile with the materials and the rhythms are ch are are ch more challenging for some people than others but one thing about organic orchestra i want to say is as i said it doesn't matter the instruments in the ensemble you know, I have a record out of 12 guitars, organic guitar orchestra. Mm -hmm. I went to Italy. I conducted, I think, uh, 10 pianos, you know, in orchestra. It can be sometimes I'll have no bass players. Sometimes I can have eight bass players. That's not the issue. It's about, and, and it doesn't matter what the, the background is. It's about the intentionality of the musicians and the, the seriousness, the joy joyful seriousness they bring 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 to it and uh um and they're willing to be studious i always try and find the musicians who want to learn and study and develop and then it's all about what we call alchemy and the chemistry and the relationship between between all of those things and as we know when it happens so it's not really right and wrong isn't even uh part of it when you're in tune with nature how can you say that tree is wrong because it grew that branch? Uh, yeah, How, definitely. That wrong. That bird is wrong. No, there's no wrong, right? You know, but there is quality. And the last thing I want to say about the organic orchestra is that I also have created it so that musicians of a huge range of experience can play in the same ensemble together. This is something I saw in Africa and I saw in Bali and in Indonesia. We come up with this idea of everybody has to be super, you know, virtuoso in some way together. Okay, I, I understand that and I do that. But in the organic orchestra, if I can, sometimes I might have somebody who is um, maybe has a, is not so sophisticated with certain kinds of knowledge, harmonic knowledge, another person might have, right? But there can be, how can I find a way for that person to bring out the magic of who they are and what they do in the same ensemble as somebody who is maybe really super virtuosic, but we're all together. And this is the thing about, this is actually opens up a whole other conversation we have another time, but this idea of class and what we think about mm -hmm. uh the caste system, the class system in music that, you know, classical music, 
and you know folk music, all these ideas of what's up and down. I don't believe in any of a caste system or class in music. It's what is the spirit that the person can bring. And everybody, if they come to the organic orchestra when I travel and teach it, if they come with sincerity mm -hmm. and open ears and play from their naturalness and from their heart, then I can find a way for them to be in our preparation for the concert. I'm not just teaching them. I'm listening to them and trying to find out how can I create a way for that person's voice to shine, which might be different than the other. And that, that's the humanity of it. That's the sharing part of it. Because the sharing part is lifting for everybody into our into our collective transcendence, you know, and that's that. These are the things that make life worth living, right? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> so, Adam, thank you so much for that. It was an amazing talk. I already received a lot of messages from people who were watching, saying, "Oh, this guy is a genius." So. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was very, very nice, though. And I really hope that uh, afterwards, all this crazy stuff, you can come to Brazil. I will do my best to help you to, you know, to to try to let's see if it happens. And and anyway, it would be great to spend more time talking with you anytime in New York, in Brazil, wherever. So thank you so much. It was awesome. You're welcome anytime to call, even just you and I, whatever you want, you know, because I know we're we're studying. I didn't get a chance, of course, you're interviewing me, but I didn't get a chance to ask you about how you do what you do, which is very interesting to me too. But maybe another time we'll 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 talk again on on uh, this way and and continue, you know, because dialogue is uh is uh beautiful, you know. So yeah, all right. That's thank for you. sure. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And take care, be safe, everything you good too. for you. Peace and love.